All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks so much for joining me tonight on a, a beautiful Thursday evening right near the summer solstice. So the days are getting longer. Um, so thanks so much for, for being with me. And if you're watching uh, on YouTube uh, after the fact, then welcome to you as well. Uh, hopefully the audio levels are good and the video levels are good. If there's any problem at all, just let me know uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, by now, I think I figured out all of my settings um, and just want to say thanks so much for joining me tonight. I uh, want to start the week just letting you know that, you know, my heart is just so full right now. Uh, just there's been this huge outpouring of support. Uh, last week, I had uh, two sort of big wins, which was my CFP designation and finally getting that CFP designation and then also winning an award from the Responsible Investment Association. Uh, for a uh, the individual award for all the market education I'm doing and you know, it was just so cool um, I've got a stack of messages that I want to respond to I've just been going through all the sweet messages from people kind of throughout my career and all these people that I've helped and uh, It's just so beautiful So I'm gonna try to carve out some more time over the next few days just to go through everything and just really you know so grateful for all the support that I'm getting and uh, a lot of love I feel a lot of love so I really appreciate that. Uh, I've got a fun show for you tonight. Um, really, really big news in the world of uh, sustainable ETFs here in Canada, which is that Wealth Simple has launched their new socially responsible portfolio. Uh, and rather than using other ETFs, normally they would sort of pick and choose the best ETFs. Uh, they've decided to create their own ETFs. So this is a new thing for Wealthsimple uh, to, to create their own ETFs. And I'm gonna take a look at them. They launched, I believe, yesterday. I had a whole bunch of people message me saying, Tim, what's up? Are these good? What's going on? So we're gonna take a, a deep dive into the Wealthsimple ETFs uh, just in a few minutes. Before I jump into that, I do just wanna start with a quick little market overview. Uh, I've gotten in the habit of doing this and I do think it's really helpful just to give people a sense of where we're at. Um, you can see that today markets were very flat, like blissfully, blissfully flat. That the US market was down 0.06%. This is, you know, makes me so happy that things, you know, it's just, just a little bit calmer than it's been over the last few weeks. Uh, if we look at the All Country World Index, which is sort of my benchmark for the global stock market, uh, we can look at it over the last six months, right? And then down here, uh, uh, what they've done here is 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 really we can see that uh, uh, the market has, uh, you know, really I would say about 10 days ago was sort of when it did reach that high, when I was worried that this sort of exuberance was getting too much. Uh, it did tumble a little bit and then has now sort of found a nice little stable ground over the past couple days. So, you know, really it's, it's still, I would say, on the grand scheme of things, if we look at where we were before the crash, we're still below those levels, but it, the markets are still very, very high. You know, realistically, we are kind of where we were back. This is sort of October 2019, right? If we look at that in terms of the, the, the time horizon there. So, you know, it's, it, it, I still, I was happy to see this little dip last week. To me, it's still a little bit of exuberance, still a little bit, probably people overly optimistic and am worried about a second wave. Um, got a question here from Shiraz. Uh, Tim, well, Simple is a socially responsible tier for a long time. Is this entirely new? Yeah, so they've redone it. Uh, basically, let me get through this qu quick little market overview. And then Shiraz, I'm gonna come back to your question because that is an awesome segue into that segment and I'm excited for it too. So let me just finish this up. Um, let's look at the VIX, the volatility index. You know, we can see this, you know, you saw it spike during the crash. And then really in the last couple uh, weeks, we did sort of see it spike again. It came back up. Um, this is a measure of volatility within the markets. You know, we're now at 33 again with today. Be nice and calm, this is what I want. My dream is for it to get below 20. That to me would be a signal that it's okay to sort of start moving things around, that the markets are a little bit calm. We got down to about 24, but then it jumped back up. So hopefully we will see some calmness. Um, and then the last thing I do like checking is the price of oil, that I do find it's useful. We are here in Canada. You know, I think it's a cool exercise just to keep an eye on where we're at. 
we can see uh, WTI West Texas Intermediate. We're sitting at about 40 bucks a barrel, so again, has come up a little bit. When we look at WCS crude, this Western Canadian Select, which is Alberta, you can see we're sitting at 30 bucks a barrel. So there is still a differential, you know, but we are getting closer to about the break even, of about 35, 40 bucks a barrel. Uh, in Alberta is kind of where they need it to be in. And I think that they are uh, uh, seeing things come back up. So, okay, uh, that's good for the market update. Really, you know, I think what everyone in the chat is already getting on are these well simple ETFs. So let me just like jump right into that. Uh, so well simple has had socially responsible tier for a really long time. Uh, they launched it in, uh, uh, I think it was 2016, 2015, 2016. And this was one of my first uh, uh, um, sort of big articles that I did. I'm, it's not even, I don't have the search because I'm logged in. So I have to do Sustainable Economist Wealth Simple SRI. And I wrote one of my top performing blogs of all time, which is How Sustainable Is Wealth Simple's Socially Responsible Portfolio. You can see this was April 2016. And, you know, the too long didn't read is that, you know, it wasn't great straight up. It used CRBN, which uh, I do have a question on this, so I'll talk about this ETF in a little while. But, you know, it had a lot of things that I didn't like. Philip Morris, Tobacco, General Dynamics, Monsanto, Walmart, Nestle, all these things were in here, which I really wasn't very happy about. Um, as well, uh, this Vidi uh, International Equity, you know, it was just very, very strange in here. I had like Gazprom, which is Russia's largest natural gas company. So it was socially responsible. Um, what they've done, and Mike, thank you for responding on this, that, you know, they, I, I gotta say, they're pretty open about the fact that they know it wasn't great. Uh, and they wrote a little piece in their magazine. Um, this is two days ago, it looks like this launched. Uh, so uh, this was June 16th, so yeah, two days ago. Um, and, you know, they acknowledge that it wasn't perfect. Um, so what they did is, you know, transparently, we realized there was a problem with our SRI portfolio. You know, one of these sort of no shit Sherlock moments that, you know, I told them about four years ago. But in fairness, um, you know, there, there weren't a lot of great options. And they couldn't find an outside fund that really did what they wanted it to do. So last year, they started building their own ETFs, uh, which to me is a really, really cool thing. Well Simple has been uh, uh, expanding in a number of different ways. They bought something called Simple Tax, uh, that is a tax software solution that I personally use. And so this was like last year. So Well Simple doing investment stuff, but buying this like tax software, you know, was a signal that I think they're trying to grow their business and expand into other areas of personal finance. So, you know, they went ahead and they built their first ETFs. Um, so there are two ETFs for the global, to get global coverage. Um, and their model portfolio, uh, we can look, but really it's very simple. It's these two ETFs plus bonds. Um, but this is the Solactive Wealth Simple North America Socially Responsible Factor Index. Um, so this is the specific index that they're tracking for North America. And then they also have the Solactive Wealth Simple. Uh, 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 this is going to be uh, Developed Markets X North America socially responsible factor index. So this uh, uh, developed markets, X North America, is a fancy way, often an acronym that'll pop up is EAFE, -E, Europe, Australia, and the Far East, the Far East, Far East being Japan and Hong Kong. So it's not gonna have China, it's not gonna have companies on the Shanghai exchange, uh, it's not gonna have India or Brazil, those emerging markets, but it will have the rest of the world's developed markets and then it's X North America because, of course, we're going to get our North American exposure through this ETF. So they just split it 50-50, you know, half into North America, half into this other one. And this allows us to see exactly what's inside uh, the, uh, uh, the portfolio. Now, it's a little bit annoying. I sort of struggled because I wanted things by, uh, you know, it kind of gives it to us by uh, alphabetical and then by these index shares, which is a really strange you know, methodology, it depends on the share price. So that was kind of useless. So um, we actually, I reached out to Well Simple, and um, they told me that they updated. So this is at the end of the day yesterday, they published this this morning, I think knowing that I was gonna ask some questions. 
Um, and this gives us the full list of companies with the index weighting. Now, as we go through this, I'm gonna look at it through two lens, first on the uh, sustainability side, because to me, that's what I like looking at. And then secondly, we will look at it on the financial side, because there are a few things buried in the index name that give us some clues in terms of their methodology. Um, so really, when we look through the companies, first, I can, I can show you the uh, things that they specifically wanted to exclude. So let me just see, uh, they, they decided they didn't want to do ESG, that they felt that the ESG, you know, is, is uh, process right now is flawed, that they rank companies within a given industry, right? And then invest in the highest scoring companies. They don't like this approach because they talk about it being responsible relative to other companies within a given industry, which I totally agree with. Instead, what they did is they created their own negative filters. So what they did with theirs is they created a number of negative screens, okay? So they absolutely get rid of thermal coal mining, coal power generation, um, uh, 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 as well as oil and gas related companies. So this is what I would consider fossil fuel free. It's too young for me to do the extensive screen yet, but it does look pretty good in terms of being fossil fuel free. Uh, they got rid of the top 25% of carbon emitters within each sector. Oops. So again, it's not about the ESG score. Instead, it's really about getting rid of the top, uh, 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 um, uh, the top quarter, like the worst 25% across sectors based on carbon footprint. Um, from there, uh, UN Global Compact, these are gonna be major controversies. Uh, they get rid of weapons, weapon manufacturers and defense contractors. And then as well, the quote unquote sin stocks, tobacco, alcohol, uh, gambling, adult entertainment. You know, it kind of cracks me up with gaming. You know, I know, I know a lot of people who are gambling have probably migrated over to Wealth Simple Trade and are starting to do options trading. To me, this has always been a bit of a funny thing, um, you know, but these are the very standard uh, sin sectors that are normally omitted from these ETFs. And then to me, the thing that really stands out, this is the biggest thing, as far as I'm concerned, they really push the agenda forward on gender diversity on the board of directors. That typically this is not something that's addressed at all, or it's like buried somewhere in the ESG score. Um, the, there's the one fund from Horizons ETHI that required one woman on the board of directors, bit of a token problem there perhaps, in this case, companies must have more than three women or more than 25% of their board of directors has to be women. So to me, this is awesome. Uh, I did research 12 years ago about gender diversity on the board of directors. And that what we found is there's a huge amount of evidence that suggests that gender diversity boosts uh, company performance. Uh, we can measure it in a couple different ways, return on assets, return on equity. There are a few different studies, you know, these are just kind of the top headlines here. But what we found is that like, yeah, basically uh, a bunch of academic studies suggest the presence of more female board, uh, members. Um, uh, oh, this is, oh, this is too bad. This is kind of against my findings. Um, anywho, many popular press articles and fund managers make the claim right so mckinsey thompson reuters credit swiss it looks like this person might have a different idea um so it'd be curious you know this is one thing that i would say is up for debate however in my experience gender diversity does have a a, a positive correlation to positive return on equity is it causation do companies are they more profitable because they're more women I can't tell you that, but what I can tell you is from my studies, now this was 10, 12 years ago, but out of all the ESG issues, the one most strongly correlated to financial outperformance was gender diversity on the board of directors. So to me, this is kind of the cool, this is a cool thing. And I think that, you know, a lot of people are, are gonna be really surprised about this. Um, when I spoke to Wellsimple earlier, I asked them about these screens, like these are pretty intense screens, and they said it screened out about 60% of the universe, that fewer than half of the companies made it through these screens. And in fact, you know, I asked about why they did the North America fund 
instead of doing a Canada plus a U.S., you know how normally it's like Canada, U.S., E-A-S-E, Europe, Australia, Far East. In this case, they did North America because there weren't enough Canadian companies go getting through the screen. The, the gender diversity on the board of directors here in Canada is horrible. So that's why they decided to make it a North America ETF, which in my mind is better. Hey, I'm happy with two ETFs rather than having to buy three. So that's like the methodology. That's what they're doing in here. You know, uh, uh, um, this is not a thematic fund. You know, this isn't going to be sort of green technologies, things like that. A few companies will make it through by default. But I want to be clear that in my language, this is not a doing more good ETF. This is very much a doing less evil. This would be the core holding within a portfolio. And then we could then carve out part of our portfolio for thematic investments in green technologies, water infrastructure, etc. If we really wanted to. So when we look at the North America, you know, let's look at the companies that are inside. Um, I can see here uh, 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 Hydro One is the top holding. Hydro One, Canadian company, you know, and this speaks to me as some pretty, pretty remarkable uh, uh, that, that Hydro One would be in there. Um, you know, a couple things stick out from this. So number one for me is that how the heck is Hydro One, which is not a huge company, so heavily weighted? The reason for this, and I was able to confirm this, is that if we look at the index, you'll notice that they say it's something called a factor index. What this means is that it, most ETFs, most indices, are weighted by something called market cap, which is the size of the company. This one is not weighted by market cap by the size of the company. Instead, they use this thing called a multi-factor approach. Um, uh, uh, you can just Google this idea of multi-factor. It's the, the Fama French five factor model that this is like a famous thing and that there are all these different, you know, financial metrics that they're evaluating. What this means is that the biggest companies aren't going to be at the top, that you can have Hydro One in here. Notice that number two is Agnico Eagle Mines. So again, this is a mining company that gets rid of fossil fuels. It's not going to screen out mining, but it is going to get rid of the worst quarter by, uh, 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 by carbon footprint. It's going to get rid of any mining companies with major controversies, right? And then it, uh, sort of human rights abuses. And then any mining company that doesn't have at least three women or 25% female representation on the board is out. So, you know, again, there are going to be some things that are questionable in here. And obviously, it's going to be up to you to ask yourself, are these deal breakers? You know, Coca-Cola, General Mills in here. Again, you know, lots of sugar and Coke. Uh, uh, so that is going to be an issue for some clients. Uh, really, it's going to be the major flags. And if there are any companies in here that you want me to, like, uh, dive deeper into, to learn what they do or to show you their ESG, I'm happy to do that. You can see Canadian companies like Shaw, Loblaws, and Magna are in here. Uh, I've noticed that it doesn't have a lot of the big banks. Um, however, you can see Amazon is in here. And Amazon is a very, very contentious company, right? This is one of these issues where, you know, there are a lot of people uh, have a deal breaker when it comes to Amazon. However, it does make it through this methodology. So there's, it's never going to be perfect. They kind of had to make these choices between how strict do we want to go and then in terms of financial performance, you know, how, how strong are we trying to make it to find that balance. Amazon is always a great example because obviously the stock price has done just remarkably well, right? And you can see in here, you know, if we look at the five-year performance on Amazon, you know, from 640 a share up to 2600 a share right now, and you know, I'm someone where I purposefully like don't buy from Amazon if I don't have to. I'd way rather buy directly uh, uh, from a seller or you know from a different retailer. Uh, that said, you know, would I be willing to sacrifice this financial growth, right, in my investments in order to not own Amazon? That's something me personally, I think I probably would be okay with that. You know, I would hope for, for a little bit more of some other companies like Shopify or, you know, some that I feel are doing a little bit better um, on the, the ESG side. But when it comes to uh, 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 personal preferences, this is really going to be about you. This is really going to be about are you willing, you know, where are you on that spectrum? But, you know, Amazon I know is going to be a deal breaker for some people. Uh, as I scroll through the remainder of the companies, you know, Canada Goose, that's kind of funny. 
uh, you know, Bristol's Myers Squibb. Uh, so there is going to be some uh, uh, pharmaceuticals in here. Uh, you know, BCE, that's Bell Communications. Uh, I know a lot of the Canadian companies, Quebec or, you know, things like this, but you're going to recognize Best Buy, etc. You know, uh, uh, really, it's fascinating to me, Netflix, Apple, Alphabet, which is Google and Microsoft, right? Major, major companies here. Again, fairly small percentages. And it is what it is. But, you know, these companies are all, uh, you know, considered sort of overvalued. They are more expensive stocks. So you can see how in this multi-factor approach, you're going to have less exposure to them, where some of the other ETFs we've looked at that are cap weighted, these are the companies that are going to be right at the high, at the, at the top of the list with the heaviest weightings. Uh, Facebook is in here. I know some people will probably have some feelings about that. Uh, uh, you know, but otherwise, those would probably be the major flags that I recognized. In here, there wasn't anything else that really sort of drove me nuts. Bank of America does squeak through, PNC Financial Services. So, you know, but again, I don't see any of the major banks. Um, my guess is that they didn't meet the gender diversity screens, would be my guess. Uh, you know, it would be fascinating to look at something like RBC board. I'm just curious. I don't know this is the case. Okay, if you want the fees, Gail, I see that question. I will get to that. You're going to be very, very happy about that. But I'm just going to, I'm very curious about their board of directors. Uh, so here we go. Okay, there's one woman, two women. Oh, three. Okay, so it wasn't the gender diversity screen. Fascinating. I'm actually impressed here. So, you know, very, very curious there. Um, okay, good news is that in terms of the fees, and this is where it gets a little bit awkward because I don't think they have it in the, you know, this very specific, like it's not like a normal ETF page, that other ETFs page. They just did it in their FAQ. So the fees on it, I believe, are 0.2%. Here we go. WSRI, which is North America, is 0.2%. Uh, the, the one that's the rest of the world is a little bit more expensive, 0.25%. These are super, super cheap, um, which is awesome. I love that the fees are coming down. I can't tell you the balance between Canadian and US. I would actually have to go through and like pull out the Canadian ones and like do the math myself, um, I think, just because they don't have those breakdowns. Let me see if it's popped up on Morningstar. I checked a little bit earlier today and it wasn't on there, but WSRI, I believe is the ticker symbol. And it's just not in any of these uh, uh, databases yet. So in a future date, I'll be able to get you data around the, the sector balance, the geographic balance, the carbon footprint, all that fun stuff. That data will come likely within the next month. Uh, these aggregators will be able to pull all that data. But for now, we are really limited to looking at just the holdings. Um, Duncan asks, uh, can you buy it outside of Wellsimple? Yes, absolutely. So these are ETFs. We can buy these in Questrade. We can buy them on whatever platform we want. Um, it's just that Wellsimple, the way that they've structured it is that these are available through their robo advisor. So you can see they have these different things. So their Wellsimple trade, this would be the equivalent of Questrade or RVC Direct Investing or TD Web Broker. Um, you could buy it through any of those platforms. However, what's in my mind a big deal is that they do offer it through Wellsimple Invest, which is their robo. So this is the thing where it's gonna be automatic rebalancing for you. You can see they've got it here. Now, again, you know, really the question for me, invest in a better world. To me, again, these are sort of the, the, the doing less evil approach. We're really getting rid of the worst stuff. If you wanted to add in your own ETFs, oh, that's interesting, uh, here it is. If you wanted to add in your own doing more good ETFs, you couldn't do it through this feature. Instead, you can see here, you know, if we were to do, let's say, a nice balanced portfolio here, you'll have your 35% bonds, and then they're just gonna split it almost exactly evenly between the two. A little higher on the North America, but just barely. Even on the growth, you can see it is actually even, and on the conservative, you can see it is even. I'm guessing it was just for awkward numbers that they didn't make it absolutely even there. Um, but so really, you know, this is great because to me, this is going to be a nice, simple starter portfolio for people that don't want to bother with the rebalancing or anything that you can do this. It'll be entirely in Canadian dollars and they will rebalance it for you. 
That said, if you are comfortable with ETFs and doing it on your own, even better, you don't need to pay the robot. Instead, you can just use your online broker or you can use you know, a simple uh, trade that these are ETFs that are in Canadian dollars that between two ETFs give us that global diversification um, and you know, in my mind are pretty darn good when it comes to a sustainability perspective. Uh, let me go through the companies in the uh, X North America just because I do think that that's a worthwhile uh, uh, um, uh, exercise to do. And then I do want to talk about what I would consider to be the downsides for them. So I can just show you the international ones. Again, it's not going to be the biggest companies at the top, right? Uh, Husqvarna, uh, uh, um, Electrolux, they're a Swedish company that I love. They, they were part of a case study I did in Sweden. Adidas, which I know has a very high ESG score in the apparel industry. If I'm honest with you, I don't know as many of these companies. Novartis is going to be pharmaceuticals. SAP, this is like a German software company. Oh, Christian Hansen Holdings, I do like them. They do uh, uh, some cool things in the food sector. So again, I'm not seeing any major red flags. In fairness, I don't recognize these companies as well as I do the, uh, 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 the North American ones. It's just not my universe as much. But I know companies like Deutsche Post have a really high ESG score. Nordia Bank is gonna be one of the top banks. Um, you know, so really I would say that this is very, very impressive. Um, that, that uh, yeah, that from a sustainability lens, I'm, I'm happy. Um, the last thing on a sustainability side that I am happy with is that I've spoken to them and that they've hired a firm called, uh, um, uh, uh, what is it? I want to call it SSI. Hold on. I had it in my notes here. Where are my notes? Yeah. ISS. I got that wrong. I was like, SSI, that's strategic, uh, sustainable investments. That's the name of my first company. So it's not, it's a shareholder. So they do uh, institutional shareholder services, ISS. This is the company that Well Simple works with to be able to do a lot of the screening and they're getting some of that information. What's really cool is that ISS does do really, really good proxy voting services. So I'm encouraged because this has been a bit of a problem when it comes to ETFs. BlackRock hasn't been great. Vanguard has been quite horrible. Um, you know, and I am doing a little bit of research this summer into this, uh, but I am pretty happy. I think that they are going to be pushing these companies in a more sustainable direction. So kudos to Wellsimple. It's pretty amazing to me that they've created this product with multi-factor, you know, pretty deep analysis with shareholder engagement, and they're doing it all for 0.2, 0.25%. Uh, fees really I can't imagine they're making a huge amount of money when it comes to the fees I think what they're trying to do is build the brand and bring people to the invest uh, 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 Platform with the robo advisor, which means that for those of us that would buy it directly through quest trade or another platform um, I think are gonna be really good uh, I think that we're really gonna benefit from that because it is such low fees um, so in terms of the things that I don't love about it um, you know, it's really going to be interesting to see the breakdowns when I am able to see the sector breakdowns, the geographic breakdowns. Um, but my concern is that there just aren't a huge number of companies inside of it that, you know, for uh, 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 an approach that is supposed to be sort of like doing less evil and get us these broad market returns. You know, I think there may be, you know, 80 to 100 companies um, inside of each of them. So we're looking at, you know, uh, uh, potentially our global equity portfolio of only about 200 companies. And, you know, obviously we're trying to cut it down. That's what we want. We want to get rid of all the nasty ones. So losing out on that diversification, you know, is probably a trade-off that a lot of people are okay with. But I got to say, you know, I did assume that there would be more holdings in here. Um, and that, that really, uh, 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 that I'm, I'm going to be watching this. Um, the second thing is the, uh, uh, the, the weighting approach. The fact that it uses this multi-factor approach is fine. There's a lot of evidence that suggests it, but again, this isn't going to earn us market rate returns compared to something like the all country world index. That's not what they're trying to do here. They're not trying to track the S and P 500 or the TSX 60 or any of these standard benchmarks. They've really gone out and created their own benchmark. 
Now, from what I'm seeing, it seems to be a pretty cool benchmark. I do like it, but there's a lot of uncertainty. I just, I can't predict future performance on this. And although I will say, I think it's really well positioned with the low carbon, uh, with the, the gender diversity, um, that it really, you know, it, the proof will be in the pudding, in the track record that it has. And I'll be so curious to watch these ETFs. Um, the last thing that I'll bring up is that, you know, a little bit disappointing to me that there are no concerns, although they do so much around gender diversity, there really is nothing around racial diversity. Uh, and this is something that obviously has just, you know, popped up or not popped up, but it's really come to light, I think, for a lot of us in a much more meaningful way over the last few weeks with all of the protests. But there, with such an emphasis on gender diversity, I'm sad that there isn't also at least some lens when it comes to racial diversity. Now, uh, I did come up with it. I did speak to uh, uh, the chief investment officer at Wellsimple. They're telling me that they are having these conversations uh, within Wellsimple with their index provider, you know, really think that, that there are going to be uh, uh, some changes to this potentially. I think they've designed it in a way that it will be flexible, that they could change or update that methodology. But again, because of the way they've designed it, I do expect to be something by a more, uh, to have a more turnover than an average ETF, that it's not always going to be the same companies and then with movement at the bottom, that this is something where these index weightings absolutely could change on this, right? So I can see that as, as a problem and that there could be companies added or dropped off, that it's really gonna be important for Wellsimple to be completely transparent, not just as of June 17th in an FAQ, but to have this like updated on you know a daily, ideally a daily basis, so that I can see exactly what's inside this portfolio at any time, because it is gonna change. Uh, I see a couple questions here. We can see this. Uh, did the index page break down the sectors? No, sorry, Steve. They don't. It's really, it's frustrating. Now, there are some documents. I think I can get the fact sheet. And I wonder if it has the sector breakdowns here. Yeah, it looks like it does. So maybe we can get the, the country breakdown here. It doesn't look like it gives us the sector breakdown. But I wonder, Gail, back to your previous question, we can probably do this. So you can see here, you know, composition by country. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, it looks like Sweden is really high. Yeah, SEK, Swedish Krona, 30%. Wow. So 30% exposure to Swedish companies. And then Japan, Denmark, Norway. So really heavy when it comes to Scandinavian. I mean, it shouldn't be surprised given those screens, but pretty stark to see it there. So again, you know, on the, the you can see why I'm, I want a little bit more data when it comes to these country breakdowns. Let's look at the North America one, um, the documents and the fact sheet, um, and see if it gives us the breakdown between Canada and the U.S. We do get it here, Gail. Look at this. So it's about 75% U.S., 24%, 25% Canada. So you know, very interesting. This would have what I would call a slight home bias. That you know, Canada, our market's about a tenth of the US, you know, tends to be maybe even smaller in some sense. So, you know, this would be a little bit of a home bias by going with this North America approach. Um, uh, uh, Wesley, yeah, Vulcan is third on the list. They don't even have a sustainability ESG report. DR Horton, same thing. This is not an ESG fund. So again, this is this is going to be a, uh, uh, you know, a, a preference thing where really this, I want to be clear, these are not ESG that well simple looked at esg they decided it wasn't ready there was too much confusion there's too much you know comparing it to other companies within their own sector so really what they're doing is is uh uh, uh just getting rid of it on on specific criteria my question with vulcan and dh horton would be do they disclose their carbon footprint because part of the methodology is getting rid of that bottom 25 percent and that suggests to me that companies do need to disclose. So I would be very curious to see whether Vulcan and, uh, and or DH Horton have uh, uh, done something like the carbon disclosure project, such that even if they don't do ESG or sustainability reports, that they do publish that carbon footprint data. That's my guess here. Uh, Duncan for Swedish Electrolusk, Husqvarna. Yeah, I know, right? Let me see if I can get the companies 
This is the North America. Let me go back to the developed X North America. So um, I think the trick here is gonna be this security ticker that this tells me the Stockholm Stock Exchange. So, you know, I don't know if it's Nibe or Nibe, I don't know, Electrolux for sure Swedish. Svanska, Serioloska, Aktio Bolaget. I'm gonna roll with that. Uh, that sounds right, I think I did that well. Uh, Latour Investment, uh, Boladin, these all look like they are Swiss, or sorry, uh, Swedish. Uh, Henkel, you know, my, I'm guessing this is German. Adidas, I know is German, right? So you can see I kinda have to decipher it a little bit, but I am seeing, I'm guessing this would be Norway, I'm guessing this would be Japan. So again, you know, it's a little bit tricky, but we do get some clues about what's inside of it. But I will tell you that I actually hadn't seen this breakdown by country before. And, you know, my eyes are popping out of my head a little bit just with how much exposure there is to the Scandinavian countries. But then again, you know, should we be surprised that they've just been so much further ahead uh, in terms of disclosure, in terms of a lot of these issues? I think that my guess is if there are some problems or like problem companies, that they're actually gonna be in the North America one, that they are gonna be, you know, companies like Vulcan or DH Horton or, you know, other companies that aren't publishing a lot of sustainability data. You know, it, it, it upsets me a little bit that they might squeak into something like this, even though they don't broadly disclose, but just because they, you know, sort of were able to tick the right boxes there. So it is what it is. I'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you guys think? Thumbs up. Thumbs down, thumb sideways. Are, are you gonna switch? Do you wanna wait? I would suggest waiting. I would say give it at least a month until I can like look things up on Morningstar and get you a carbon footprint and all that fun stuff. But I would love to know sort of where you're at. Um, you know, Gail, in terms of compared to my easiest pie portfolio, so if we're comparing this to DRFG, so let me just bring it up. You know, I've got my easiest pie portfolio. Um, and where is it here? And so, you know, compared to DRFG, you know, they both use the multi-factor approach. They're both fossil fuel free. Um, you know, to me, the well simple ones are a lot cheaper than the Desjardins ones and they seem to be somewhat similar. Really the big difference is that Desjardins has like 900 holdings. The well simple ones are probably only gonna have, you know, somewhere from two to 300. Again, it's okay, it's not, ideal but you know it probably is going to be a little bit cleaner because it's got fewer companies there uh from there um what uh, uh uh really what i would suggest in terms of my portfolios the one that it likely replaces is this vanguard cheap as fuck esg portfolio where i did these vanguard ones that this was like us and then international which was the rest of the world and I think it'll likely replace these with the, uh, uh, you know, with the North America and then the, the uh, X North America, you know, for the rest of the world. That, that to me, I mean, Vanguard again, this one has, I think, 1500 companies in it. This one I think has over 3000 companies into it. So these really are gonna be the ones that are, that are hyper diversified. Um, but, you know, uh, my guess is that, that the, the well simple ones are, you know, giving you very, very similar exposure, although with much, much fewer holdings. Um, okay, question from Steph here. If we already hold ETFs such as SDG or ETHI, would one of the main benefits of adding these be additional com company slash country diversification since the methodology is different? So in terms of diversification, specifically with SDG and ETHI, SDG, I kind of view it as its own thing. That's the iShare, uh, iShares MSCI Global Impact ETF. To me, that's kind of, it's its 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 own, that's more of a doing more good. So I wouldn't compare that. That to me is kind of a uh, separate. Uh, from there, uh, ETHI, you know, really the diversification benefit is gonna be that with ETHI, it is cap weighted. So we do get a lot of exposure to the top, the biggest companies in here. I won't even look at all of them. I'll just show you the top 10 because this tells you what I'm talking about, you know, that it really is cap weighted. So to me, the biggest diversification is not gonna be so much the, uh, uh, the, the exposure, the sector or the country. There would be a little bit of that, but mostly overlap. Really, it's gonna be about the different methodology, this idea of cap weighted versus this multi-factor approach. 
that I could see an argument to be made there that there is a benefit to diversification by having both of those approaches. That historically, the multi-factor approach, the, the, the academic evidence suggests that that will be more optimal over the long term. But over the last few years, the biggest companies have kicked butt. Like they've done so well. So to me, you know, if you did want that diversification, it would almost be on the, the company weighting side and those two different methodologies there. That said, you know, it's been a concern for so many people that ETHI is so heavily in the US. And I think this is a really big concern. Um, what I'm, you know, what we could potentially do is to look at the North America, uh, or sorry, the developed markets ex North America as a way of sort of propping up that rest of the world. The only issues that is that again, this is developed markets. When it comes to ETHI, it's developed markets only. Notice no China, India, Brazil. So there is still going to be the gap of emerging markets, right? And we are starting to see this with a lot of the ETF families that are coming out. There's just no emerging markets. I think a lot of the, the fund companies have just said, you know what, it's, it's, it's super, uh, um, you know, it's just really challenging to do ESG in emerging markets. So we're just not going to do it. So, you know, it's an interesting thing, but obviously more options. It gives us more possibilities, more ways to do it. I wouldn't want you to like confuse things, but you know, if you're looking at ETHI and SDG and being like, uh, you know, I'd like to diversify it a little bit more. I do feel that you would benefit from some diversification by adding in these two into the mix as well. Although you certainly wouldn't have to. Um, Shiraz here is saying, I've been good on well, simple black. In fact, good job getting to the front of the queue on that customer service. Now, um, uh, a good two plus years now, socially responsible. Yeah. So you are switching to this. So you've already switched to this. If you were in the Wealthsimple SRI portfolio, they did it automatically for you. And this does have impacts. One of the things that I've been looking at is the assets under management uh, for the Jancy Social Index, which used to be, this was in the old one. And at its high point, I saw this at about $130 million under management. And then in the last two days, it's dropped back below 100 million. I remember I wrote a tweet to iShares and to Sustainalytics when they crossed 100 million. I was like, congratulations, you hit 100 million. That's such a big deal, like digital high five. And now they're back below 100 million because all of Wealthsimple's SRI clients have swapped over um, automatically into that new portfolio. So it is what it is. You know, if you were a client with them before, you probably like this new portfolio better. Although again, you know, it's going to be up to you. I will give them huge kudos. I think they, you know, really did take things uh, uh, further in the right direction. Uh, Duncan, have they published anything on historical uh, performance? So no. So this is one of the frustrating things for me because these are custom indices that they built, Soul Active built these for them. There really is no, you know, uh, now, oh, I, I, I take that back. It looks like they did back test these performance. So the tricky part is going to be, I don't think I can chart them against anything. So it looks like they just give me this chart. This would be a huge grain of salt because everything would be back tested here. Um, and, uh, and that it's going to be really hard for me without any, uh, 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 uh ability to, compare it. Let me play around with it. I wonder, like sometimes these things do have a little uh, code. So there is this ISN. Do they have a little lookup? Let me just see if by chance I can get it on Morningstar. No. And let me just check Morningstar.com. Um, and sometimes the US site is just a little bit better with these I, uh, ISIN code, no, it's not giving me anything. So, you know, I'll keep playing with it. You know, if I had a Bloomberg terminal, uh, I would be able to look it up. I don't think I'm gonna be able to get it, uh, get it on any of these platforms yet. So uh, we're gonna have to wait for this. Um, okay, cool, yeah, Gail, ESGV is not super green. I know it only gets rid of a few things. So, you know, you can see why this is the trade off more diversification, but more, you know, not so great companies versus less diversification, but a lot squeaker clean. 
Uh, Mark, yeah, absolutely. These fees seem close seem close to those of the iShares Advance. I spoke about it a few weeks ago. So pretty much par for the course. So you can see there's this new equilibrium between BlackRock and Wealthsimple really pushing these fees down. This is such good news for us sustainable investors. Um, you know, for the longest time, it was a major trade-off that the fees were so much higher. And so I'm, it just makes me so happy to see those fees come down. Uh, Shiraz, thank you. You're welcome, my friend. Thank you for participating and contributing. Uh, Natalie, I have all my savings this, so thank you for this webinar. You're welcome. Hopefully, well, simple. Uh, get this. Uh, you know, send this out to all of your clients. Put me in your newsletter. Um, you know, if this is an educational resource for for people who own this, you know, really, really happy to dig into it. Again, we're a little bit limited with the information that we have right now, uh, but we are going to get more info in the coming weeks and months. <sighs> How's everybody feeling? Everyone's good. Let me get a drink. Hold on. I've got my little cold brew coffee back here. I'm trying to keep my energy levels high for you on this hot Thursday evening. I've got my fan off in the background so that it doesn't create noise. I think of you, the things I do for my audience. Um, so I think that's a good review for now. What I'm going to do is move on to some questions that I got from clients. And there were a couple in the comment section from last week and uh, a couple things. So I did get a couple questions. Um, I'll go through those now. Um, if you've got more questions, by all means, please throw them into the chat. Um, know that that's, uh, uh, that's what I'm here for. So, okay. So Jerome had asked me, and this is kind of a, a I sort of skipped over this. Um, uh, oh, Tina, you're welcome. My pleasure. Hopefully this gets more people. I just want this stuff to be more accessible. So, you know, if more people have it through Wealthsimple uh, 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 Invest, I'm thrilled. So um, Jerome did ask me about uh, CRBN. And I think this is a good thing that I'm happy to go through it because this was part of the old one. Um, and that you can see why I didn't love the old one so much. So CRBN is the iShares MSCI All Country World Index Low Carbon Target ETF. This is designed to track the ACWI, the All Country World Index, which is the thing that I always show you in my market outlook as the standard benchmark. So what they tried to do was to replicate that All Country World Index, but get rid of fossil fuel companies. So there's no Exxon, Suncor, or any of those you know, companies that own the fossil fuel reserves. Um, but um, it does still have some pipelines and it does still have tobacco weapons. So it's really only for people worried about climate change is that specific issue. Uh, what's really cool about CRBN is that I can chart it compared to the All Country World Index. So we can look at this over the last five years and then we can add in CRBN. Oh, disappeared on me. Hey, what just happened there? Hold on, sorry about that. There we go. CRBN is what I'm looking for. And I'll make it green even though it's not that green, but it is the greener version. And you can see how closely it tracks the, the blue line, the All Country World Index, over the last five years. It's been almost identical. Um, and that really, you know, it's outperformed by the tiniest little bit and you can see, you know, the green one does seem to be a little bit on top because it didn't have a lot of those comp energy companies that have performed worse. But CRBN is a way of really being able to get that all country world index at the lowest carbon footprint. So what I can do is just show you uh, ACWI, which is the benchmark, and MSCI does give us the carbon footprint of this portfolio at 170 tons. This is a carbon intensity. So this is the weighted average carbon emissions per million dollars in sales. And that simply by doing CRBN, um, we should be able to lower it quite drastically. Oh, I became all fuzzy. It's probably because I moved my camera, sometimes has an autofocus. So you can see here, hopefully, hopefully I'm back to clarity. Um, but if the, uh, uh, you can see here, CRBN has a much lower carbon footprint of only 55 tons. Uh, it's still going to have some issues. It still has some brown revenues, right? It's still got some pipelines in there. It's not an ESG fund. So CRBN is going to still have this, you know, triple C and companies with bad ESG scores. 
but CRBN really is a way if uh, it's in US dollars and if your only goal is to lower your carbon footprint, CRBN is gonna get you market rates of return while drastically lowering your uh, uh, carbon footprint. Um, Wilson, thanks for clarifying. Gail, I know sometimes if I like move my head too sharply, the, the, the camera refocuses and I go fuzzy for a moment, but hopefully I'm back to clear as crystal. So, um, so CRBN, uh, just to finish up uh, answering Jerome's question, you know, really there are some issues there. Yeah, 29 tons versus 123. So, you know, this is on Fossil Free Fund, depending on when we looked at it, slightly different methodologies, but definitely it is gonna have a, 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 a very, very low carbon footprint. And that it is gonna be lower than if you were to look at the other uh, iShares ETFs, KLD, ESGD, ESGE, that you know th those don't omit fossil fuels, so they are gonna have a higher carbon footprint. So really, CRBN, I give it a thumbs up from a climate perspective, but it's gonna get a thumbs down from a lot of the other perspectives. You can see here, you know, global compact violations. So these are gonna be, you know, really, really severe issues in terms of human rights and, and major controversies are in here. Tobacco is still in here, controversial weapons are in here. So really, it's the, if the goal for you is simply to lower your carbon footprint, CRBN is the way to go. Um, I will bring up, because it was on the homepage of Yahoo Finance, and I noticed it just before this call, that it does look like BlackRock, i.e. iShares, has launched new ETFs in the US. And what's cool about them is that they are mimicking the ETFs they did in the here in Canada. So Canada actually came first, but you can see they've launched the iShares ESG Aware these are gonna be conservative allocation, moderate and growth and aggressive. So these are these like all in one ETFs. These are all in US dollars. So we didn't get these here in Canada, but they use this, uh, this ESG aware methodology, which we do have. These are gonna be like, what is it? Uh, um, X, uh, oh, it's not CSR. That's the fossil fuel one. Uh, XSUS, I feel like that's the US one where these are going to be the ESG aware family that those now exist in US dollars, which is great. Oh, where did my tab go? Hold on. I can get rid of all of these guys now. Here it is. Um, from there, they also filed for ESG advanced. US and EAFE. So again, these are the ones that were launched in Canada a little while ago. I did my review. We can link to that review. These are now available in US dollars as well using this ESG advanced methodology, which is going to be fossil fuel free. So if you wanted to keep things in US dollars, you know, this is going to be ESG as well as fossil fuel free. And I do think that there is a huge competitive market you know, shaping up between these iShares ESG Advanced ETFs and then these new wealth simple uh, 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 socially responsible ETFs. Going to be really interesting to see which ones people prefer. Um, again, the main difference is cap weighted that these MSCI ones, the bigger the company, the heavier the weighting in the portfolio versus the wealth simple ones, which are multi factor weighted, which are going to be a, a little bit lower exposure for the biggest companies. Um, and that kind of gets into as well, uh, I think it was, uh, whose question was this? This was, uh, hold on, I think this was Mark. I believe this was your question from before, uh, saying that you sold all your VGrow uh, for the iShares ESG ETFs, fantastic. Um, it's all in our TFSA and we're looking at doing the same for the RRSP. I keep reading that we shouldn't invest in Canadian ETFs in our RSP due to withholding tax. Is this a real concern? If so, is there a US compatible? So, okay, so this gets into a huge question around withholding taxes. And that, yeah, what this means, this is good news for you, Mark. Yeah, I thought it was you. I was pretty sure this was you. I didn't put your name here, but uh, I recognize your little avatar there. So, um, so that this, uh, this is really good news for you, that you know these ETFs do now exist in US dollars. When it comes to foreign withholding tax, it's a little bit tricky. And what you're doing, and I want to be clear, this is really getting into the weeds now, where we're looking at these little nickels and dimes. 
the way it works, the usual way I deal with foreign withholding tax um, is that we really want to avoid US dollar securities inside our TFSA, that this whole thing is a huge issue. Um, and really we get dinged hard. I wanna see um, is, is that we, I don't think this is gonna give it to me. Give me a moment here. Uh, yeah, this is not the document. Um, and oh, uh, Mike, the ESG equivalent to VGrow, this is gonna be in US dollars. Where was it? I had it here. The growth one is gonna be e Eeyore. Oh, this is so, I feel like this is like Eeyore, like the, the, the sad donkey. That makes me sad. And that's how I'm gonna remember this ticker symbol. But um, E-A-O-R, that this would be the equivalent to VGrow. Let's see if it comes up. It should. Um, I don't know if it's out just yet. I just, I don't know if we have the, literally this, this was in the news today. So um, let me see if I can just get it quickly for you. If I go to the iShares website, let me see if it's under their product page. I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on this because sometimes it can be really, really tricky on the first day. But if we do these uh, sustainable, here we go. Do, do, do. No problem, Mike. I got your back, buddy. That's why I'm here. So uh, ESGU, these are all of the older ones. Uh, here we go. So uh, yeah, they're just, it, I don't see them here just yet. If I do here, here, uh, done, yeah. Uh, what was it, E-A-O-R, I think that was right. And I'm just not seeing it yet. So it's not even on the iChairs website yet. So literally these things are too new. Um, that's right, EOR is available in the, U that's right. That's my understanding is what's going on here, that this is gonna be a US dollar equivalent. So, okay, let me get back to foreign withholding tax and I'll see if I can do it. And there is a foreign withholding tax explained and um, I think it was Justin Bender, I want to say, did the chart. Here we go. And I believe this is the chart that I love. But let me first explain that really the biggest issue is U.S. stocks or U.S. denominated securities in the TFSA. That this is the huge problem is that we do get penalized. We pay 15% of dividends. So 15% just of your dividends goes to Uncle Sam, goes to Donald Trump, if you hold US dollar securities inside your TFSA, EEP. So that's why we don't wanna do that inside of our TFSA. With the RSP, it gets a little bit trickier. And what you're doing is taking me a little bit of a level down. So forgive me, I'll go there, but this certainly isn't my expertise. That you can see here, we have US listed ETFs, we have Canadian listed US ETF that holds a US listed ETF, which is a lot of these Canadian hedge ones. And we have a Canadian ETF that holds stocks directly. And so, you know, what they're saying here is that, uh, uh, um, that really by account type, that US account, so you can see here, the U.S. government does not withhold taxes on U.S. security dividends if they're held in an RSP. This is due to the current Canada-U.S. tax treaty. Thus, a U.S. listed ETF of U.S. stocks will not have any tax withheld on dividends paid to an RSP account, right? This does not apply to TFSAs and RESPs. This really is for RSP accounts only. What this means is that it is preferred to hold a US listed ETF that hold US stocks. That this is the only way for us to eliminate any foreign withholding tax. What we're suggesting here with these, for example, the Wealth Simple ones or the iShares Canadian dollar one, Canadian listed ETFs that hold uh, US listed, uh, uh, oh, hold on. Yeah, they're saying here, holding Canadian listed of US listed ETFs in an RSP. So this creates a little bit of an unrecoverable uh, uh, foreign withholding tax. 
Let me see if I can get, because what we're really looking for is this level, uh, um, the Canadian ETF that holds stocks directly. So let me just see if I can show you the white paper here. Here it is. This was done by Justin Bender and Dan Bartolotti. Dan Bartolotti is the Canadian couch potato, kind of a hero of mine. So you can see here, they do the same thing. And what I want to get for you is, so this is a US listed ETF of US uh, uh, stocks. In an RSP, uh, level one withholding taxes do not apply. Fantastic. There are no withholding. This is, uh, uh, um, uh, this is extremely tax efficient. What we're talking about is this number three. Oops, oh, hold on. No, it's further down. Canadian listed, no, it's not even this D1. Hold on, hold on. Emerging market stocks directly. Oh, this gets so annoying. Oh, with emerging markets and everything. Okay, let me go to the summary and see if I can clarify. I don't wanna to get too into the math. As you can see, it is very, very confusing. Um, so in an RSP, US listed ETFs often have a significant tax advantage. It's not massive, but it is something that, that really, the issue here is that you do have to convert Canadian dollars to US dollars. So if you're comfortable with Norbert's Gambit and you know how to convert money back and forth, and the same uh, ETF exists in Canadian dollars and in US dollars, in an RSP, the US listed ETF is the most tax optimal. That's the only way you're gonna avoid all foreign withholding taxes. However, you do have to be very, very worried about when you're uh, converting Canadian dollars to US dollars, because if you don't new use Norbert's Gambit and you get dinged, it's gonna wipe out all of the benefits here. In a taxable account, so this would be uh, an unregistered or emergent account, Canadian listed UET ETFs are generally a better choice. And again, they'll get into the big picture a little bit. In a TFSA or RESP, always use Canadian listed ETFs, right? And uh, what's gonna happen is they see here that if you use a Canadian listed ETF for international equities, an ETF that holds the stocks directly will be more tax efficient than one whose exposure comes via an underlying US listed ETF. So really that's not gonna apply to us. Sustainable ones don't exist here. But this is my way of saying to you, Mark, that really, you know, if you can get the US dollar ETFs, that is gonna be the most efficient, tax efficient way of doing it. And that now lucky for you that they have just launched these ESG advanced ETFs in US dollars. Uh, obviously they don't have the Canadian one here, it's just US and EAFE, Europe, Australia, Far East. So for the Canadian one, you would have to do the, uh, um, uh, uh, you would have to do the Canadian dollar version of that, but you would want to do that anyway. Uh, I'll just quickly touch on the big picture I think they had the big picture thing, but really what this gets into, what their big picture, here it is, is that there are just a whole bunch of costs that you need to worry about. So the cost of currency conversion is a huge one. And Wes, I'll get to your question in a moment. Consider your income tax situation. Sometimes that is gonna affect things, whether it's even worthwhile looking at it. And then obviously the record keeping, you know, what sometimes it's just gonna be easier in life for us to use Canadian dollar ETFs. So, if your goal is to be the most efficient, the most perfectly efficient, then what you would want ideally is US listed ETFs inside your RSP account that then hold those stocks directly. That these will be a little bit less taxes than Canadian listed ETFs that hold those US and international stocks. So in the weeds, you can see this foreign withholding tax it's a nightmare. Thank you so much uh, uh, um, to the everyone at PWL Capital for making this uh, white paper for me. Uh, Wes, are markets stable enough to handle the waiting game necessary to do the gambit, Norbert's gambit? So this is this is a huge thing. This is why I tend to show you the VIX at the start with my market overview. That you know, really, it's it's tricky. I would say that things are have become a little bit more volatile over the last couple of weeks, and I would like to see it wait. Um, you know, just to show you all country world index, 
you know global stock market if I look at it over the past five days uh, it's not gonna give me the percentages but you know we've ended up right back to where we started a week ago right so this if we had the crystal ball this would have been a great week to do Norbert's Gambit right just because the the change in currency or the the change in the stock market hasn't exceeded that one and a half percent the issue is that if we look at it over the last month you know you are rolling the dice because if you wait a week before you invest you know then all of a sudden you might end up losing more than one and a half percent which is what you're saving by doing over scambit now that is true in all times but right now at this moment in time the vix you know it is on the higher side you know it is still at 32 I would like to see it back below 20 before I'm like, you know, Norbert's Gambit, yeah, definitely worth it, do that all the time. Really what it comes down to is why you're, you're converting the currency. If you're looking to convert the currency before you buy something, so you have to wait a week, at this moment in time, I would say just like eat the one and a half percent and just, you know, just because the odds that the market's gonna move more than one and a half percent in the week that it takes, I would say is pretty high right now which is why I would say just buy the security that owning it and being able to buy it today is probably gonna be more valuable. That said, I know sometimes, you know, people have clients in the US or they get paid in US dollars. So now they've got all this US cash that they're trying to transfer over. In that case, the market volatility really doesn't matter. You know, frankly, it's not like, I would say do Norbert's Gambit. That's always gonna be the cheapest way to convert cash into cash. The downside is just if we're looking to convert cash into cash to buy stocks, sometimes it's, we're better off buying those stocks now rather than waiting a week. Really, if you're just looking to exchange the money, that's when we want to talk about currency exchange rates and like look at the, the, the currency exchange between the Canadian dollar and the US dollar, which has been kind of ridiculous uh, over the last little bit that, you know, and I don't have any way of predicting it, but you know, really, if you're doing you know cash to cash, this is really the only chart that matters. Um, it doesn't really matter how stable or volatile the stock market itself is. What matters more is the currency exchange market. And you can see during the crash, the Canadian dollar got really weak. This was when the price of oil was super cheap. Remember, we are still a bit of a petrodollar. And that as the price of oil has come back up, right, the Canadian dollar has gotten stronger again. So, um, you know, what I would say, Wes, is the rule that I'm using right now is that if, if I'm doing it to do a trade, I'm usually just eating the one and a half percent and just doing the trade and letting the system convert it for me. Uh, that said, you know, if I'm, if I'm planning to keep it in cash, then, uh, um, you know, I want to do Norbert's Gambit and then just sit on that cash because that's the goal. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, I don't think I have any questions. Uh, oh, sorry, Mike, uh, a bit. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to there. Um, perfect. Okay, so are there any other questions for me? Uh, otherwise, the only other question I had that I did get, um, I did get it from uh, YouTube. So I'll just check really quickly, and I know Denise asked me a question. And I wrote a response here on YouTube um, and it's about crypto. And so I'll just show you here, Tim, are you against cryptocurrency exposure? If a Bitcoin ETF debuted, would I invest? So crypto is like a huge, huge, huge topic, huge topic. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh my, yeah. We said I have a bit of a petrodollar. I get you here. Yeah, just a little bit, eh? Just a tiny little bit of fossil fuel uh, exposure here in Canada. Um, so basically for me, you know, when it comes to crypto, I'm not a huge fan. I had a bunch of company, a bunch of clients get ripped off uh, with Quadriga when that closed. If you don't know about that, Quadrigo went, ended up going bankrupt. It's actually come out recently that it was a Ponzi scheme. So that money ain't coming back, which is very sad. So to me, you know, with crypto, just I would almost treat it like gold. And, you know, I, sure, if you really wanted to do it, you could do it like five to 10% of the portfolio. But really the things that I would want in order for crypto to be part of a core portfolio is number one, RSP TFSA eligible. So if there was an ETF, if it was eligible, that would, to me, make it a lot more attractive. And to me, you know, really it comes down to assurances that the assets are being held properly. 
um, you know, it can be uh, uh, really, I think, uh, 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 problematic right now that with crypto, with the blockchain, there is a lot of transparency, but with the exchanges and the way the markets are conducted, there's a lot of shady business there. So I would want, you know, we often joked about before the gold standard, you know, that, that you needed like a picture of inside Fort Knox, like show me that the gold is inside Fort Knox. I want to have some assurances that like the crypto uh, is actually, the cryptocurrency is actually in that account. And that I would want, you know, really severe audits and really, really strong assurances before I kind of trust it. Yeah, Mike's comment here, a crypto Ponzi scheme, color me surprised, right? But like, you know, there were a, a lot of really sort of dodgy people playing in this market. Um, so I have a lot of concerns about crypto. Um, that said, you know, if there was a Bitcoin ETF, if it was RSP TFSA eligible and there were proper assurances in play, place, then sure, I would be fine with it. Similar to gold, where, you know, some people do want to keep gold as part of their portfolio. Uh, Gail asked the question, uh, why is no one making any emerging market ETFs that we discussed? Great question. Uh, all we can bug well, simple and BlackRock and ask them, you know, really what it comes down to is a huge challenge of doing uh, ESG analysis in emerging markets that it exists, but you know, they're, they're a lot further behind than we are in terms of disclosures and in terms of transparency. And, um, you know, it's just really hard for analysts and for, for these index providers that a lot of the data just sort of isn't there or we don't trust it as much as we do uh, uh, when it comes to the developed markets. So, you know, I think that to me is a challenge that will likely get overcome in the next five to 10 years. But, you know, it's important to remember that all this ESG stuff, all this sustainability stuff, it is really new, you know, that, that it is evolving very quickly that, you know, we've been doing it and we've got track record for the last like 10, 15 years. Beyond that, it gets very dicey. There just wasn't a lot of data and that, you know, really it's only been in the last probably three to five years that we started getting data from emerging markets and you know, from talking to a few analysts, it's very, very challenging when it comes to emerging markets. So I think for now, what a lot of the fund companies are doing is just kind of like playing it safe. I think they're really afraid of greenwashing, of including a company in one of these funds or in an index or an ETF. And then all of a sudden it turns out that that company was doing horrible things and, you know, really they would get nailed for greenwashing because that company was inside the fund. So, you know, I've seen these, the sort of ESG aware ones, the ones that are sort of a small step in the right direction, you know, with a Vanguard or, you know, if they're not really using ESG, if it's more of those negative screens, that can be a little bit easier. But, you know, if, if we applied well, simple screens, if they were like, okay, you know, Tim, we need to, where is it? Uh, you know, uh, uh, they need to disclose the carbon footprint and we need at least three women or 25% gender diversity on the board of directors. My guess is that, you know, between those two things, the proper disclosures and the gender diversity, that that would eliminate a massive percentage of emerging market companies. So, you know, I think it'll come. I think everything is moving in this direction, but I do think that we're gonna have to be patient. Really the best one is, uh, you know, I've talked about it before, but is the SDG, this iShares uh, Global Impact ETF. To me, this is the one linked to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's likely gonna be something like this, you know, where instead of the negative screens, it really is looking at companies that are driving positive change. My guess is that this will be, you know, the way to do emerging markets for the next little bit. Although who knows, I'm happy to be surprised. Uh, all these new ETFs coming out all the time. I'm like a kid in a candy store these days. I remember when, you know, there were none of these available that, you know, I was dealing with F-series mutual funds and, you know, scraping these massive uh, 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 PDF documents to get the data. And now it's like two suites of ETFs, sustainable ETFs coming out in the same week, Wealthsimple and iShares in the US. Just like, okay, great. Here's like a bunch of new ETFs for me and this is one week in June. So, you know, fingers crossed that things will continue to evolve, uh, things will continue to progress. Uh, you know, really, really encouraged by the developments this week. Uh, I think Wealthsimple's done a good job given, you know, some of the constraints. 
That said, you know, I don't think it's going to be perfect. I don't think it's going to go far for a lot of clients. And, you know, it is a little bit disappointing that they don't have any of the doing more good things uh, embedded into their model portfolios that, you know, clients really are going to get can get that well simple invest or can get those ETFs on their own, whatever platform they're on, and then likely are going to be deliberate and sort of carve out part of their portfolio for those doing more good options. And hopefully we'll start to see even more of those options available. All right, how's everybody feeling? Um, it's 8.15, I've been at this for over an hour, so I'm feeling good. I feel like that's a great show. Uh, happy to answer any last questions. Oh, did get one here from Lauren. Uh, would you consider SDG as emerging markets or impact equity or both? So it is kind of both. Really, when it comes to this one, it is, I would consider it impact equity in that it's doing more good. It's not a negative screen. It is around looking at what the company actually sells. So I do consider it sort of like impact or like, you know, thematic, but kind of by default, just the way they have it structured, it does have significant exposure to emerging markets. Uh, this is annoying. It's not gonna give me the full geographic because iShares is annoying with their data. Let me see if I can get it from Morningstar and I might actually go to the US site just because their interface is a little prettier when it comes to the US uh, uh, ETFs. SDG, here it is. And that uh, if I can do, oh, is that just news? Hold on, quotes and site, uh, this is strange. Dismiss, SDG, uh, oh, it probably wants this one, here we go. Portfolio. So, ah, that's annoying. It just says non-US. That's so frustrating to me. Um, region, here we go. So when it comes to this SDG, we can see here, uh, you know, only a tiny little bit for Africa and the Middle East. You know, really it's gonna be Asia emerging. You can see here 10% plus 3% in Latin America. So it's really only, you know, 13, 14%, you know, no Europe emerging. So, you know, it is limited. I do wonder, I think Mexico would fall under North America. So there might be a little bit more, but let's call it 15% emerging markets, which is not gonna be a huge amount. This isn't by any stretch an emerging markets ETF, but Lauren, really what I'm communicating here is that this is one of the only ways for us to get exposure to emerging markets. We don't need a huge amount, right? If I look up the all country world index, uh, it's not gonna be a huge amount in terms of emerging markets, but there is gonna be some in there. And so to me, just because, you know, diversification I think is always a good thing. Um, you know, I do love it when there is some exposure. So you can see here Europe emerging almost nothing, but 1% for Africa. Asia emerging, Latin America. So actually, you know, Asia uh, emerging, it is, SDG is overweight on that. That overall, oops, reloaded there. Um, you know, it's only maybe about 10% emerging markets. You know, 6.61 plus one, I'll call it seven and a half. Yeah, 8% emerging markets, uh, maybe 9% if we count Latin America. So again, it's not gonna be, it's not like SDG is, it's gonna give us all of that. That's only gonna be a small par portion. But even if we do, you know, 10% for SDG, all of a sudden that gives us one and a half percent or, you know, 2% exposure to emerging markets in the overall portfolio that we wouldn't have had before. So hopefully that explains how I think about SDG. Uh, maybe I can do a show where I do a bit of a deep dive into that. Uh, Gail, thank you for the kind words. Great show, my, my pleasure. Uh, hopefully you've gotten a kick out of this. Uh, hopefully more people now are gonna ask themselves what's inside their portfolio, especially with Wellsimple. Uh, companies addressing SDGs is largely about Western companies' impacts on developing world, hence representation from US and Europe. Wes, I would agree with you. Just be aware that when it comes to this ETF, it's not so much looking at the goals themselves and a lot of the philanthropy involved. This is about identifying companies that are building their business around products and services that are linked to the SDGs. 
So, you know, it is, it's, it's an interesting take on it. Uh, maybe it should be a, a deeper dive. Uh, Ayeta, my pleasure. Good to see you. Hopefully we can chat soon. And uh, hope everybody is having a wonderful night. Uh, enjoy the summer solstice. Get out there. Get some of that sunshine. And uh, know that, that I'll be here next week uh, with a new show for you. If you've uh, listened this long, if you watched this long, you know, do me a huge favor. Click on like. Uh, subscribe to my channel. Throw a comment down in the comment section uh, telling other people how awesome it is. Uh, anything you can do to help me out with the YouTube algorithm robots, would I would be very grateful for. Uh, everybody have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you soon.